Well, hello, friends. Welcome one and welcome all. I can't offer much in this outdoor hall, but sit here and rest. You must be weary, and I'll share with you Tales of Tyria. <laughs> Yes, ladies and gentlemen, this week on Tales of Tyria, we have a bunch of show updates, a lot of great links to talk about, and Build Wars 2, traits and specialization. It's all coming right up. Stay tuned. Welcome one, welcome all, welcome to another exciting episode of Tales of Tyria here on the Sound Strategy Network. You can find us at talesoftyria.com. I am glad you got a hold of the program, however you may have found it. Please tell a friend or two about it, won't you? Because we are almost live. That is to say, we will be live eventually from the Rosewind Tavern in the great free city of Lion's Arch. I am your host, Bridger, and we're here to talk Guild Wars 2 again this week. Lots of great stuff going on, so and let me introduce you to the panel we have around here today. Aku is taking Kai's place today as she is still recovering from her recent surgery. Welcome, Aku. Hey, everyone. It's good to be here. Good to see you again. We haven't seen you in a while. Yeah, I've been having some troubles, but uh, it's glad to be back, and let's talk some Guild Wars. All right, excellent. We've also got Freelancer joining us, as always. Welcome, sir. As always, how's it going? <laughs> good to see you. Good to see you. I, I, oh, I'm looking forward to disagreeing with you yet again this week. <laughs> <laughs> These are always the best things ever. We, we shall once again spar. <laughs> once more unto the breach, ladies and gentlemen, and, and here with the cool head to bring us all back down to the level is Jay Vega. Welcome, sir. Good evening. All What's right, up? so. This week, we've got a couple of quick show updates for you guys, uh, and uh, I'd, have, uh, I'd have the chat room please let me know how the stream quality is coming through here, because I have a couple of uh, tweaked settings, hopefully that will fix ourselves here. Uh, so, we're looking at the show updates here next week, and this is a very important one. Next week, the show that is on the 11th of March will actually be recorded four hours earlier than normal. So instead of 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, it will be at 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time next Sunday. And the purpose of that is to allow our European listeners to come and pay attention to the show, because uh, I know a lot of them say it's just too late for them to stay up, etc., and they'd love to be a part of the chat room, but uh, they just can't, so that's what we're doing for them right there. Also, don't forget, if you enjoy the show, we happily would love for you to leave us a thumbs up or a subscribe on, on YouTube or leave us a review on iTunes. We've already got a lot of great reviews on iTunes. We really appreciate that, guys. And uh, let me just say one more quick thing. Thank you to Aaron, Darren, and Sean for donating within the last two weeks or so here. So if you guys feel like donating help the show, it does cost a little bit to keep the website up and to keep these uh, the, the audio shows up. The hosting does have a cost. So if you want to help us offset those costs, you can donate with the donate button on the right hand side of talesofteria.com feel free but do not feel obligated finally a little bit of side pro uh, cross promotional news here uh, the final Tales of Heroes episode has just been released to the Sound Strategy YouTube channel, and uh, much to the to the dismay of many of my Company of Heroes fans, I understand uh, a lot of them are very disappointed that it is going to be the final show, but I just had to shift focus here over to Guild Wars 2, and Company of Heroes, while I enjoyed it for these past many years, is finally just going to have to, have to go away. So the final episode, number 86, is up, and boy, was it a fantastic one. Check that out on the website. It's also got a link in the show notes. Moving on to actual Guild Wars 2 stuff. We have been confirmed. Next beta event is in late March. Oh, man. I was so hoping it was going to be this weekend. Like, right now. <laughs> like, sorry guys, we can't do the show. We're playing an awesome game, but it's not Guild Wars 2 because we can't tell you that. I'd hope, I was hoping for like a, a mid to late March so that you yeah. have a little bit of hope that it's, you know, earlier rather than later, but they just straight out said late March. What, what do you think holding is holding them back right now? What, I, what do you think is the reason? I don't know. I mean, it's, I they got to be implementing changes from the press beta, right? That's what I'm thinking. Yeah. I think they're they're doing that, and they want it to be 
very polished and come out with a good impression considering this is going to be, you know, the one time, I mean, the first time that everyone besides the press is seeing it. So I think they want to make a good impression. Yep, that's probably true. I mean, uh, they probably got a ton of feedback from the press in terms of difficulty and bugs and this and that. So I, I wouldn't be surprised if the version that we get to play, when we do get to play it, is, is significantly improved. Uh, I actually, actually saw a couple of bugs when I was watching the videos. Go ahead. Now, Macular brings up a good point that maybe they weren't anticipating having a million applicants for the beta. <laughs> that's true. <laughs> well, we were just going to lend everybody who, had, who, who applied, but a million's too many. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I I think they went into the mindset of, you know, we want everyone to try this thing. And they're like, whoa, hold on a second. There's a million of you. We got to gotta rethink this a little bit. All right. So that's that's great. We'll be looking forward to that. I can't believe March has five weeks. Like if late March, we could say, okay, it's the last two weeks of March. But now it's five weeks. And so now we have to wait like an extra week. It's like, screw you, March. Stupid five-week <laughs> month. All right. So... There's another couple of cool links on here, and uh, I'll point these out as we get to them. Right here, we have a very interesting uh, thing that's been making the rounds. Uh, the Guild Wars 2 map, world map, with zones and levels and labels. So let me zoom in on this a little bit so you can get an idea of what we got going on here. This is the most interesting one. You can see uh, basically all of the different areas. This is something basically somebody zoomed in really close on all of the videos that they could get their hands on to find out what all these level areas were. As you can see, the Ruins of Ore is a strictly level 80 area over here uh, up and it basically seems the closer you get to an elder dragon the tougher things get I mean go figure <laughs> <laughs> I'm guessing that uh, that uh, we'll see up here this is fighting the minions of Jormag over in the north uh, Shiver Peaks there and this is just a really interesting and cool map check it out uh, the link is there in the show notes for you if you're if you want to check it out other things on here did you guys see this video the 20 things you didn't know about Guild Wars 2 I have not did. Yes, you did. What was it's it a about? Quick, like, it's a quick, like, one-minute video. I, I was actually Just, surprised. I, I th there was a couple things on there I actually didn't know. I was like, I took, I was like, challenge accepted. <laughs> 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 did you guys know everything that was on there when you watched it? Oh no, not at all. Uh, not at all. I, I personally was a big fan of the login screen. Yeah. <laughs> The being able to log in under under an invisible like I guess veil is pretty cool and. You know, and if you so happen to forget your password, it gives you a nice little green bar to say that, hey, your password's right, or if it's red, your password's yeah, wrong. Yeah, I didn't understand that. <laughs> the little password, it says you get a hash, colored hash that shows if your password's right or not. I'm not, I'm not following. I thought if your password's right and you click log in, it'll just work. Like, I'm not sure what the purpose of that is. Somebody has to fill me in. Maybe the chat room knows uh, who has seen this here. Maybe has a better idea. Um, the other cool thing that I saw there, besides being able to log in as invisible, is you can nickname people on your list. Which means if Freelancer has like 17 alts and, uh, and they're all like <laughs> different like Feeble and Meeble and Joe and Camel and like I have no idea which one is Freelancer, I can go in and manually change each of those alts to be at Freelancer if I want. So I see like 15 Freelancers on my buddy list, but only one of them is online at any time. So I thought that was a really cool concept. Um, yeah. I like that a lot because I, I always had that problem in other MMOs that a lot of the times you forget people's alts and you're like, oh, so what's your name? And it's like, dude, it's Bob. You know, you know me. We play it together all the time kind of thing. Yeah, the only solution is to make like Bob 1, Bob 2, Bob 3, or Bob the Warrior, <laughs> Bob the Necromancer. It's like, really? Yeah. That's just so lame. <laughs> so uh, that's a cool, little, a cool little bit of information there. Uh, I will pull this up now. We've got... Uh, Oops, wrong one. This is here. Uh, the PC Gamer went and did basically a uh, graphics overview, which is very cool because one of the things you'll notice in this video, and there's a link in the show notes for people that want to check this out. Show notes, of course, in the description if you're watching on YouTube or you can find it on TalesOfTeria.com in this specific episode number 21 here. Uh, he is actively changing all of the graphics options here, and you can actually see the difference that it's making on the screen in real time. It doesn't have to reload anything. It just actively, bam, you can see the difference. And so if you have a little FPS counter in the upper corner, you can very quickly kind of get an idea of where you want to have your graphics set. It's also got a slider that just, you know, has presets for best graphics versus, you know, best performance. I thought this was a really cool concept. And I guess this has probably already been done in Guild Wars as well. But I, I there's been so few games that do this real time stuff. Were you guys impressed by this or was it just like a meh? 
I I really liked it um, when I thought it was really interesting. Well, you know, they were saying how they wanted to make the game accessible for even sort of I guess lower end computers and whatnot. Um, but the thing that I was interested of is that this scene, the battle scene, where you see all the the spells and everything being cast on the highest settings, it's very chaotic. Mm-hmm. And if you turn the settings down a little bit everything seems to be a lot more visible. So I guess I would ask Freelancer, would you turn your settings down specifically just so you could see your enemies better from a PvP kind of standpoint? Well, I'll tell you what, in StarCraft 2, um, I did for a little bit of time play that, uh, well, at least what I thought was competitively. <laughs> and I, I, uh, I was one of those guys, much like uh, you hear a lot of big names do it, that turned all of my settings down the lowest. So, uh, yeah, by the way, Overseer Cat right here. <laughs> <laughs> he's, keeping, but, yeah. he's got his paw on your throat like you better not say anything <laughs> wrong. <laughs> uh, but I, uh, I turned down all my settings in StarCraft 2 down to the very lowest settings uh, just because I found it easier to concentrate on my micro. Uh, it's uh, In Guild Wars 2, I, I got to be honest, it's a beautiful game, so I doubt I'll do that. But in World v. World, it's just going to depend on... Um, <laughs> I can't take it seriously. Uh, <laughs> but uh, no, it's it's like, just I'm one of those things. You. It's going to depend you. on how flashy those guardian sk- you know those guardian skills are and the elementalist skills. Because I think if you're looking at these videos that are being shown right now, the ones that really stand out the most to be almost at that borderline obnoxious is uh, the elementalist fires type skills. Mm-hmm. Uh, they just mm-hmm. seem to be all over the screen. So. Um, you know, it, it just depends. Uh, I, if there was an option to turn down certain types of spells, maybe like keep boons on, but keep uh, offensive skills toned down. You know, to that respect, that I would really enjoy it. But if it's a matter of uh, me having s- spells on and blocking my view, I'll, I'd have to get rid of them. Yeah, I think the game itself just looks so damn good. It oh, does. no doubt about that. I, I yeah. think. Absolutely. If anything, I'll turn it down for World versus World. I'll probably not want to turn it down all the way if I can get away with it. But uh, I, I definitely, in in like just PVE, I'm just going to crank that thing up because I don't care. <laughs> it looks so gorgeous. It's yeah. just too good to, not, to pass up. And I'm hoping that uh, they take a lot of feedback from this past. You know, World versus World seems like kind of the last thing that they're really finishing up. Uh, and, you know, because they can't really test World versus World without a lot more testers. So this is the press beta, I think, was their first chance to really test out the World versus World. So they probably got a lot of good feedback as to how much is too much in terms of the, the, the spells and things like that. So we'll see how they, how they tweak that for the next one, and then we'll, we can comment on that. So that was yeah. pretty cool. You know, uh, it's, it's a shame that all you see all these spells and stuff. I, I hope that they really have, there's got to be in the engine code, a hardline cap for some of these spells too because a lot of people in their graphics cards uh, when you get a hundred people on screen I mean what kind of spell effects are going to show because obviously they're going to cap it at a certain point like Mm -hmm. in WoW they capped it and Aeon they capped it what skills are still going to show when I have a hundred people casting spells on me what spells am I going to actually be able to visually recognize and that's that's really when it comes down to it all I want to know that's true, and that's why I think you can turn the spells down and still get an idea of places, you know, don't stand in the fire, those red circles are bad kind of yep. a thing. But I think the things that's going to be critical is any spells that you can dodge, like projectile-type spells, like if an elementalist is shooting a fireball at you or a ranger is shooting an arrow at you, those spells are going to be critical to see in PvP and even in World versus World, if you can, if, if it like makes sure that those are always things that you can see so that you can hit the dodge button at the right time, I think that's going to be pretty critical. Mm-hmm. So, let's see here. Uh, what else we got in the show notes? This is very interesting. Reddit, <laughs> again, always a place for really interesting things because you'll find all kinds of people. There's a student of economics that went on there and put in like this dissertation on how how real economics compares to game economics and how you know real economics is based on the concept of scarcity and game economics is based on uh it, you know even though it, it tries to model scarcity but it's not scarce so you can't really do that but it's it's a really cool read and i'm not going to go over everything it says in here if you're interested in it definitely go check it out but i mean just look at this it goes on and on Right? For a while. This is a big wall of text. And then, down here, you have another, a reply to it that says, here's where you're wrong. And then just look at, it just keeps going as well. Oh, my so, God. 
but they're all really like high level. It's not like you're a noob and here's why. It, it was really high level sort of academic quality discussion going on here, even if it wasn't necessarily academically correct or not. I don't know. I'm not an economics professor, but it was very high level sort of discussions. So that, by the way, spawned this other thread that said this is the Austrian perspective on economics or the libertarian view on economics, which is different from the Keynesian school of economics. And then this one talks about here's the difference between these two schools of economics and here's how this school of economics would look at the Gilmore's two economy. So that was really cool. And then it, apparently it got into a big political thing. But these three posts, I think, are totally worth <laughs> reading just to get just if you're just bored. It's just really interesting. At least it's interesting to me. I don't know. Maybe I'm weird. Chat room, am I weird? Is, is, is liking economy weird? <laughs> this, is, this is how economy works. I get crafting materials. I go to you. Do you want these crafting materials? Yes, you do. Do you want to work for them? No, you don't. Five gold. <laughs> Five gold. <laughs> You're gonna dance for these. What? Boy. This guy wants them too. Six gold. You know. <laughs> there you go. Gold economics, economics 101 with freelancer. <laughs> he's not. He's not an economics professor, but he'll tell you how it is. <laughs> that's that's how it is. All right. Next up, we have uh, a very cool weapons infograph that, uh, I don't know, some people are saying that this thing is completely useless. I'm going to pull it up here for you right now. Some people are saying, you know, this doesn't really tell us anything, and this is just kind of stupid, and this, this kind of completely de decries what Guild Wars 2 is trying to do. It's trying to say that anybody can do anything, and trying to pigeonhole the different weapons into specific themes is just completely denying that. What do you think, uh, Aku? Is, is this actually defying what Guild Wars 2 is about? Uh, I, I don't know who, who made the graph or the chart, but I, I think that some people who are looking into this a little bit more in depth than I think it, it really is, um, I, I think the person who made this was just kind of going in the sense of, all right, if you see a guardian with a great, uh, a great sword, you can best believe that he's probably going to be dealing some good damage. Or if you see, uh, you know, a mesmer with a, a scepter or something in that regard, you can kind of, you can kind of guess that that mesmer is going to be more support or more CC based. Um, I don't think that he, he or she was necessarily trying to pigeonhole each weapon into a, an archetype, but just more so that you know what to look for if you see these people on the battlefield. I like how the thief is every single weapon is listed <laughs> under damage. Yeah, <laughs> that's how. I the, think that. <laughs> I think that's probably why people are getting pissed off is that they're seeing certain classes that like, well, I wanted to be a thief and be a support class and according to this I can only deal damage or the same thing with like necromancer or ranger they're kind of, you know, limited according to this to just deal damage or support um, I will so, I mean, point I out Somebody pointed out the way you support as a thief is you kill whatever it is that's bothering your teammates. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of true, though, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, it really is. I mean, uh, to a certain extent. It, maybe the thief is a you must pay attention to me type class, right? I mean, that's kind of it's almost like the thief can tank you by forcing you to pay attention to him, but you can't catch him. He's always darting around with his shadow step bull. You know what I'm saying? So, uh, <laughs> anyway, I thought this was a really... It's, it's definitely well graphically designed. They gave the, the whole painterly look. It's a very cool little graph, and I think it gives you a good overview. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I mean, think so. It has to be taken with a grain of salt, because exactly. some of that there... I mean, the Ranger... I, I looked at that a few days ago. The Ranger, I believe, didn't have a heel of some sort on it. So, But if you actually look at the Ranger specs, um, there's a class builder out right now. Um, we'll have it in the notes, I'm sure, but I'll have Malk here, I'll link it to you guys, but this class builder, you can look at all of the different weapon layouts, you can set your traits, uh, you can do all this fun stuff, and the Ranger has a lot of healing skills in all of its category, I mean, in all of its capability. So, defensive and stuff, like the Thief being all offensive, there's a lot of defensive stuff the Thief has, too. I just think that that is one person's perspective on oh, this these seem to be four damaging skills, so let me make this an attack, you know, bar it's uh i still believe all the classes are going to fall into certain categories just innately i don't see ranger i don't see somebody rolling a ranger out there in the chat you can agree or not agree but i don't see somebody rolling a ranger and imagining themselves to play as a tank throughout the game you know i don't imagine somebody that's playing a guardian to picture themselves as dps throughout the entire game i know that all classes can play roles but i think we're all going to naturally fall into certain roles depending on the class we pick all right, so 
uh, I think we can move on to the next section here. This was a very interesting post on Guild Wars 2 Guru, which that in itself is a surprise. Hey -o! Um <laughs> I kid, I kid the guru. I kid hey, the Bell. guru. There's a lot it's of... Coming. There's a, <laughs> oh, I'm so getting banned. Uh, there, there's a lot of great posts on Guru. I take it back. So, um... This one is really cool. A, he starts off by saying, this is going to be long and there will be no too long didn't read. Like I said before about the, uh, the economics post, this one was very interesting. It really kind of walks you through historically how we got to the Trinity in these MMOs, the DPS healer tank, and talks about there's only two ways that you really interact with the game mechanics in RPGs. It's dealing damage and dealing and damage negation. And for a long time, damage negation was, be was best able to be done by a combination of uh, damage reduction, i.e. tank having lots of armor, and undoing damage, a.k.a. healing. And that Guild Wars 2 is kind of going to a damage prevention model of dodging or bobbling, you know, uh, or, or using a special defensive skill at the right time uh, sort of a thing. So that's, it's a really interesting read, and I don't want to go over everything here because he does a very good job of, right, of discussing all this stuff. And let me just show you. So it looks long enough, right? Like, this is pretty long. And then it gets to the Guild Wars 2 section, and so it keeps going. But I, I think he's actually done some work on this article since I read it last. You can go to the spoiler, and he goes to all this more specific information. This is, like, really, really well done. Highly recommend you guys check it out. Very cool. Talked about the Trinity and how basically it's broken because A, you don't have any single target heals that are super viable, and B, you don't have any class that can put on so much damage reduction more than any, than other, any other class. So, very cool link. Definitely check that out. Finally, I want to end this with a discussion of the superior rune of the pirate. That's right, ladies and gentlemen. People are talking about how this is way, way overpowered. Because there's a 5% chance to shout YAR and grant might to nearby allies when hit. And there's a 5% <laughs> chance to summon a parrot every 90 seconds. Best rune in the game. Best rune in the game. I have that to say. That sounds pretty OP to me. That's definitely OP. <laughs> and and I, thought, I saw this and I'm like, this is, this is a wiki. Somebody's screwing with this, right? No. I went and I looked it up. Somebody found the source. And there's I got the source linked in the thing. You can open it up yourself and look at it. There actually is a PvP vendor video where they show. And I'm not. Oh, there's an ad on it. Who cares? We're not going to see that. But yeah, just trust me. Check out the link if you don't believe me. This is just the coolest rune ever. Uh, and that's all that I have to say about that. What do you guys think? How many... Do you want to see a rune of the ninja? To compete? <laughs> Ooh. Ooh. <laughs> I still don't think that the comparison to that Mesmer skill that it's at AOE you lay down, it instantly removes all uh, all boons from the enemy, anybody that walks over it. I mean, have you seen that skill in action? All boons like you, from the enemy? Oh, so yeah. all their uh, it's positive a, conditions. It's a Mesmer ability. I, the names, I'm lost at it right now, but you, there's a skill that the Mesmer lays down in a few different videos that just basically wipes out all boons to people that run across it. That's probably the biggest OP skill in the game right now. It was Tornado, but it's now that one. <laughs> okay. Well, I heard that the Warrior Greatsword is way, way overpowered compared to the other Warrior weapons. So uh, hopefully we'll see a lot of improvements in the balance come the beta. Well, I say the beta. I mean the beta that we get into. <laughs> the, the, the betas. The betas, indeed. There's another great, great thread, as uh, Oku points out, there's another very interesting thread about RNG ruins competitive games, or and actually the, the OP was claiming um, how I learned to love RNG or something like that. So it's a very interesting, uh, very interesting uh, bit of information there. <clears throat> anyway, uh, much to uh, Zephyrius, is that how he says his name? Zephyrius's uh, chagrin, there's a problem. You see, I'm a very emotional person. And when I get angry, it makes me upset. And when I get upset, I gotta rant. And when I rant, it's called a Bridger rant. That's right, ladies and gentlemen, I have to tell you about something I found on the internet. It was a very interesting link to a video in which we have some press. And I'm not gonna say who. There's a link in the show notes. You can find out if you want to. But there's some press going through a dungeon. And they're in this dungeon, and they're like, First of all, this dungeon is not balanced, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, what we have here is us dying over and over again. So clearly, they need to tone this dungeon down. And I was like, oh, well, that's, that's kind of scary. I hope that that's not really a problem. Maybe they'll fix it. And then I watched the video. 
and he uses his one skill. And the video ends. That's 40 minutes of the one skill and a never using the dodge. And apparently it's overpowered. I don't understand it, ladies and gentlemen. How come you? How can you even consider being calling yourself a journalist if you don't do the least bit of research about the topic at hand? This is Guild Wars 2. The biggest mechanic in the whole combat system is the dodge key. How could you even get through the tutorial without learning how to use the dodge key? I don't even understand it. And there's another post where people are basically saying. I don't think that uh, people are going to get this game. I'm really worried that people are going to try and play and they're going to sit there in front of a mob hitting their one, two, three buttons and not even trying to get out of the way and they're never going to learn that that's how they're going to have to play because remember in every other game that you've played, they have taught you that the way that what happens if you lose, it's not your fault as long as you're doing the rotation correctly. It means that your gear isn't strong enough. It means your character's numbers aren't strong enough. It's not that you lost. It's your character's not strong enough. So go level some more and come back later. That's not how Guild Wars 2 works. If you lose, it's because you're not dodging correctly. It's because you're not using the correct evasion and moving while, while fighting combat correctly. That's the real problem. But is there going to be something in the game that whacks you over the head and says, Hey, idiot! Don't forget to hitch the dodge key. I don't think there is. There's going to be people like this guy in this video who's going, Durr, well, it's too hard. I think that I'll just come back later. No, no, just read the damn tutorial. Ah, make me so mad. I don't know. Am I out of my... Uh, 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 do you think people are going to learn it, guys? Do you think there's going to be a big problem when the game comes out and the masses hit? What's going to happen? Uh I think two months in the game, we're still going to walk by people questing, letting that giant golem smash them in the face, and we're just going <laughs> to face palm because they just don't understand. And they, then when you try to correct them, they, they will snap at you. <laughs> I think we'll say that a year into the game, really. I really do. It's free, but it's fine, though, because these are the same, peop the same people that were going to be rolling in World vs. World <laughs> and in arenas, so it's fine. <laughs> so, I knew you were going to do so that. So for those of us that know how to play, these people are what we call uh, easy prey. And we like it that way, and we don't want to teach the easy prey, because then they'll be difficult, and we'd rather kill them. Um, yeah, well, there's that. Uh, what do you think that uh, ArenaNet can do, assuming that they didn't haven't already done it, and maybe the people that we're looking at in this video just don't get it, but what do you think ArenaNet can do in the early levels of the game to teach people about the more active combat in their system? I don't think they need to do anything. I think, like, games nowadays, it's, you know, they, they, they hold your hand through everything. I think the, the videos I saw alone of just the starting area of you know you fighting whatever you're fighting and the thing is blowing fire at you well dodge out of the way like it's not killing you in one shot you know they're letting you sort of take the damage and see over time that you need to dodge um i don't want them to hold people's hands and walk through this it's a very simple mechanic you're getting fire blown on you get out of the way you know it's not they don't really need to do something i hope they don't do anything you know, you'd think it's a simple mechanic, but if you've done WoW, any sort of WoW rating, you can tell people there's fire there or there's goo there. <laughs> Don't stand in it. Yes. <laughs> and they yeah. will still freaking stand in it. And then when they die, they're like, w how did I die? <laughs> <laughs> this is uh, true. They need this Dungeon Dan to help them uh, out. <laughs> I, I, yeah, I'm not going to go on a freelancer rant about end game rating, but <laughs> they will stand there in that fire, Vega, and they will just be like, derp, derp what just killed me you know and, and then god forbid you try to blame them that you know, why to stand in the fire because that just opens a whole nother can of worms and uh <laughs> go ahead See, but what i'm what i'm hoping for is that i feel that happened in wow because they only started seeing those things when they got to the end game raid oh good point with when with guild wars it's as soon as you get out of the gates and you're fighting stuff you immediately know you have to dodge things you know, so I'm hoping that later on down the road, because you've been playing the game the way you're supposed to play the game, that, you know, you, you know how to dodge and you know to dodge. I feel like that's why people didn't know to get out of the poop in WoW is because they've never had to get out of the poop before. <laughs> <laughs> so they don't know what the poop is. Yeah. Well, I mean, they as, can't as smell it. <clears throat> so many stressful nights of Ice Crown, let me tell you. <laughs> <laughs> I've pointed that out to um, another couple of people that, that 
I mean, if you watch the char areas, for example, right? If you go to the, if you go watch the char introductory areas, when they fight the Duke Baradin, the big stone guy, the blue guy that we saw at PAX and Gamescom a lot of, uh, what does he do, really? The only things he does is drop stuff from the sky in these circles on the ground. Your only job in that fight is to not stand in the fire. That's level one. Your job is to not stand in the fire, right? I mean, that's the whole job. So I think they're already trying to teach you right out of the gate. This is how this game is different. And I don't quite agree with you, Vega. I think that it is a game designer's job to provide the feedback that lets the player know what they've done wrong. Now, they don't have to hit him over the head with a text box that says, Hey, you idiot, you should have dodged. Or, now we're going to practice dodging. Use X <laughs> to dodge all of these things. And then for 10 minutes, you have to prove that you can dodge. <clears throat> that's a little too obvious. The best game design is teaching you with feedback that's very subtle, that is natural and fits into the world that you're using. So uh, hopefully... Yeah, that, 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 that's what I was getting at, is that they right out of the gate, they're giving you enemies that aren't going to one-shot you if you screw up, but it slowly is kind of like pushing you in that direction, like, hey, you should get out of the fire. You should try to dodge this thing, you know? I just... I, I, I'm just trying to look for this comic that I saw that it was gaming today and gaming 10 years ago and how nowadays they show the comic and it's a guy trying to jump over a ledge and there's, no, there's nothing on the box, there's nothing on the screen that tells you, oh, you could double jump. Oh, there's a guy coming. You could use him to jump onto the ledge. Oh, you could do this. Oh, you could do that. <laughs> it's just, it's, you learn by failure. You, you try it, you screw it up, and then you know that you don't need to do that again. So what we're saying is hopefully we won't need the equivalent of this guy. What's important is that you're having fun! Shut up, I know what I'm doing! Mikau data shows you're contributing an abnormally low amount of damage. Whatever! I'll include directions <laughs> to the nearest class trainer on your mini-map so you can respec after this run. Here it comes. Yeah, I'll get right on that. Ouch, you're standing in the fire! I like it here! Move out of the fire! <laughs> no! Ouch, you're standing in the fire! How do you like that? Move out of the fire! I'm invincible! <laughs> Detected that you've needed loot that is not optimal for your class. Oh no! You can earn the respect from your party by only rolling need on gear that suits your playstyle. How much respect will this earn me? <laughs> oh man! So yeah. Congratulations! You've cleared a dungeon. <laughs> So definitely check out the rest of that video, by the way. I'll put a link in the show notes. But that's just a good sort of uh, parody, I guess you could say. Uh, um, what's the word? <clears throat> For uh, when you use parody to talk about a very important issue. Um, satire. Satire, the, the higher form of parody. Uh, <laughs> to basically expose the problems with the World of Warcraft system. Uh, <laughs> oh, here it goes. I'll put it in the show notes. Uh, but yeah, sorry. Go ahead. Whatever I was saying before. Oh, no, I think no, no. I think at the base <laughs> level, if they just have a little message, let's say the game tracks you getting hit 20 times out of 21 times by that giant golem club, there should be a little message that pops up for those newer players that says, hey, you could have dodged through all of that, mm -hmm. <laughs> or something along <laughs> those lines. I wouldn't be surprised if the game has some sort of very minute, you know, subliminal way of saying you could have dodged through that or you could have done this or that. I mean, other games in the past, other MMOs, they've they've done like a flash or something. If you could have dodged it, uh, even while some of the mm. newer fights, they will flash or give you a warning ahead of time before the giant AOE drops on the ground. You know, they started to steer away from the instant AOEs that appear on the ground and are now going to this visual cue that happens right before the AOE hits. So, uh, again, it's dumbing it down, but. You kind of have to because we're getting as the gaming audience expands, which it is, and you start incorporating all these people that have never played Mario or Sonic the Hedgehog or or Tekken or any of these fast reflex games. And believe it or not, to be good at those, you did have to have decent reflexes. You know, there once you start pulling in all the Pagel players and the <laughs> far and, and the Farmville players, because here you got Guild Wars oh, God, too. That's did. You got Guild Wars 2 that's, you know, reaching out to all types of gamers saying, you know, you could be anything you want to be. So the Farmville player has to have the, the basic steps in line and it has to have the cues. I know the rest of us are rolling our eyes when we see those messages and we immediately X them out, but they got to be there. I mean, we got to got to be honest with ourselves. If our mother and our dads are going to be playing this game, you know, got to help them out. I, that's true. I, I think that either they do that or if you just 
get hit, you know, for uh, massed amounts of damage over a certain amount of time. They just turn all of your buttons into the dodge, and <laughs> if you don't dodge, I, don't think, I, I think there's a problem. You did not just say that. <laughs> that would be hilarious. It just takes over your control, and you just look at it, and you go, What happened? All I can do is dodge! And then after you it dodge three times successfully, it's like, All right, you've earned the right to start doing damage again. <laughs> I am so taking a screenshot of Guild Wars 2. Just one of the random videos are replacing all the <laughs> with dodge. Oh, I'm doing that right after this show. But you have to make like the dodge bar four times bigger because <laughs> that's the only thing you can do. We're so we're so mean. We need uh, to stop. <laughs> no, really, we love our noob casual folk. Ah, uh, anyway, <clears throat> moving on. Uh, that is uh, you know something I think we. Can... Anyway, Build Wars 2. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Build Wars 2. This is the roundtable for today because this is also going to incorporate a discussion of the new trait system, which we already kind of talked about, but this one really talked about how they invented some new attributes to roll into the system. And I'll, I'll throw those up on the screen here so we can very quickly look at those. Um, the new attributes that they've added uh, include prowess, which includes the damage multiplier on critical strikes. Malice, which improves the damage done by conditions. Expertise, which includes the duration of all conditions. So uh, a necro that wants to be like a condition master is going to want a lot of malice and expertise. Longer conditions and more damage from the poison. You know, things like that. <clears throat> Concentration increases the duration of all boons applied from the character. So support type characters are going to like that. And compassion, all outgoing heals that your character does, including self heals, are increased. Well, doesn't that mean that now we can have spec healers that are dedicated healers? No! No, it doesn't! Shut up! <laughs> I get tired of hearing that. I really hope that's not true, so we'll see. Anyway, they've also added, this is kind of a throwback to Guild Wars 1, if you guys remember, each profession had its own kind of specific attribute that made it special, that you could only use if you had that as your primary class. In this case, um, the warrior has increased uh, damage on its burst skills, Guardian has decreases the recharge on their virtues, meaning they can, you know, buff their allies more often. Uh, cunning is the thief's version, which increases the recharge, uh, decreases the recharge on their steel. Empathy increases pet attributes. Ingenuity uh, increases the recharge on all the tool belts for the engineer. Guile is the mesmer's recharging. <laughs> Guile. <laughs> Just makes me think of Street Fighter. Re reduces the recharge on all the shatter skills. So each of these basically elementalist is a four elemental attunements. Hunter, or sorry, hunger is the necromancer's uh, life force pool gets bigger. Each of them really affects the core mechanic of the class, which is really cool. And uh, each class then has these five different trait lines, and they're all kind of unique. And, and if you notice, actually, let's kind of look at this. Warriors have power and expertise. Guardians have power and concentration on the same thing. Thief has power and expertise. Ranger has power and expertise. Uh, let's see. Engineers power and expertise. Power and expertise. Power and expertise. So there's those are a lot. Not, a lot of them have the power and expertise is the same ones, which is the uh, damage and chance to get criticals. No, uh, expertise is the increased duration of condition. Sorry. <clears throat> Then we got precision and malice, precision and expertise, precision and prowess, precision and prowess, precision and prowess, precision and prowess. So some of them are similar, but the last one for each class is always a little bit different. So prowess and brawn, malice and willpower, malice and cunning, compassion and empathy, ingenuity and malice. So there's a lot of really interesting different things that are going on. So the classes are all going to have very unique kind of lines that they're going to... Okay, so this one's really focused on criticals for the elementalist, but maybe some other one will have partially based on criticals and partially based on power. Another one will have partially based on, uh, you know, extra health and extra toughness or extra health and extra condition. So it's really going to be a very interesting situation no matter which class you pick and on every class you pick. What do you guys, what's your first reaction to this whole traits article? I like it. I mean, it can go even deeper than that. And I know that's kind of against what you've always uh, said, Roger, but I think the more ways you can customize your character, the more, uh, the deeper the game gets. Uh, I don't know. Have you played uh, Path of Exile, the, the beta? I have not, but I've seen screenshots of that, and it is ridiculous. I'll see if yeah, I can pull one it up. Is, uh, any, anybody that is a Final Fantasy 13, and there's other games, I'm sure, that, where you enjoyed that, that way you could uh, just infinitely expand your, your uh, 
capabilities. Like, you could be exactly the type of character you want to be. Path of Exile is kind of like a Diablo... Uh, uh, esque type game <laughs> is very very. I don't want to say I found, Diablo clone. I found the image you were looking for. <laughs> uh, it it, but it, it just branches out to everything, and so I uh, I like the new attributes. I like the profession ones. Uh, I think down the road we might even see more done on that um, particular uh, idea. You know, where not only can you have hunger for necromancer, but there may be. Yeah, there's there's the screen right there. Um, <laughs> this is different. Oh this is how you upgrade the, your character. This is the skill tree. So <laughs> you're look you're looking at this screen, and, and I'll be very brief. This is a Guild Wars podcast. Uh, th you could start anywhere on this screen in Path of Exile and go any direction you want. And Guild Wars, Guild Wars Two, you know, all of these different attributes they're adding, adding that on top of all the different skills you could switch out, adding that on top of all the different weapon loadouts, you know, adding that on top of the gear you can get. I love it. I, I, I live in that moment. I like having way too many options and not enough time to decide. I really do enjoy that because um, it makes me feel like that if I do find something that works, I, I can boast about it, you know, because the chances are nobody else has that. Um, now, when we get to the competitive side of things, yeah, there's going to be ones that are just a bit, you know, more powerful than others. But I think most people out there can admit to knowing or admit to saying that they just want to be completely unique. They don't want to have limited choices. And that starts with the character creation and that ends with, um, uh, you know, your skill choices and your gear and stuff. And, uh, and then, of course, we all know Guild Wars 2 is going all out with... Uh, the aesthetic portion of things as well. They so many things. You saw the unlock video for just the PvP, right, Bridger? Where just they the, showed the uh, the unlockable PvP rewards. Oh yeah, there was just the screen just kept going yeah. on and it on. It just scrolled on and on and on, and and those were all not just aesthetic items, but they were uh, different attributes, different little bonuses, mm -hmm. different and I mean, I hope that page gets four times longer. I really do. Um, like, now that we have, uh, how many is it now? Is it? Uh... Let's see, one, two, three, four, five. I think it's, um, and then the two defensive attributes. So now we actually have seven attributes instead of the original four. Uh, maybe it's eight. I, I got to look at a whole list of them here. But that means that you can really spec out your character very specifically with regards to gear in some respects. And I believe you also get to choose uh, how you spend. You get basically an extra 300 attribute points or something that you get to put in any of those lines however you want to, in addition to the way that traits work or something to that effect. Chat room, correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, but that really gives you a lot of options. So, Aku, let me ask you. Um, we've got all of these different options to choose from. With the current system, the way that it works, with these five trait lines, and then within those, you have the specific minor and major traits that sort of affect your build. And then on top of these trait lines, and on top of the gear choices, and on top of the attribute choices, we have the utility skills that you can choose, and the weapon skills that you can choose. So here's what my question for the panel, and I'll start with Aku. How many different viable choices are there going to be with this system? Is this a system that you think really gives you a lot of choices that will actually work? Or are we going to be sitting with, okay, there's three different builds for the Elementalist, three different builds for this that is actually accepted and used by the community? What do you think? I personally feel that um, it's really going to be based on the player. And through that, I, I think there are countless, uh, countless amounts of builds, so to speak, um, you know, I personally will be playing a longbow ranger, but, you know, I have a good friend of mine who will be playing a ranger as well, but completely staying away from ranged combat. So, you know, it's just, um, I think through that alone, there will be multiple, if not hundreds of builds for a single class, and through that, you know, bringing all the class together, you know, hundreds, if not thousands. I'm being a little optimistic, but, you know, we'll have to wait and see, but... All right. What do you think, Vega, uh, when it comes to this particular massive amount of customization that we just talked about? Same question, basically. Are there going to be a lot of viable builds, or are we, is everybody going to kind of essentially zoom in on a couple of different specs that everybody should have? I really, really, really hope that it's not like other MMOs where, you know, you're, you're limited. If you make a particular class, you know, you're, you, there's only... Two of there's only two options for you: make this type of character or make that type of character. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they give you a skill tree, and you could get these different skills, and you could try different builds. But at the end of the day, there's only two or three builds that are viable. 
And I hope that with all this customization and all these different traits and all the different skills and everything, that you could get more out of it. And that, because I like being able to, you know, try new things and experiment with different skills to try and make a better build. I don't like having to, well, I'm making an engineer. Let me go online and find out what the best build is and just make that. Because I know there's no point in trying to venture from the norm. And I hope that the customization is um, at a high level and that there are multiple options that are viable. All right, freelancer. So, I mean, you kind of answered this in your last, but uh, we've got this trade system. Mechanically, do you think it's the best idea to put, like, tons of points in two lines and a little points in another line? Or is it going to be viable to throw a lot of points across the board here? I know that I've spent ungodly hours, which is your fault, by the way, Bridger. What? <laughs> about working on that character builder <laughs> that you mentioned in the last episode. So I didn't know about that until you had brought it up in the podcast. So I'm like, what is this? My you know. Bad. So after the after the podcast, I'm I'm playing with it. Before I know it, it's three in the morning, and I'm still playing with it. And my Mesmer build right now actually has uh, points in every category. So I didn't max out two things. Um, I'm sure a lot of people are actually going to do the same thing. I think what we're going to see is like, all right, everybody knows, you know, you split WoW builds or you split League builds by the number that you put in each one. So, like, my build right now is, for Mesmer, it's like 20, 20, uh, 30 and then 20 or something like that because I know there's particular skills that mm -hmm. I want to uh, basically accent my greatsword build because mm -hmm. I, I play glass cannons I always have I, my rogues my assassin and Aeon my, yeah Tal I mean, you know it so <laughs> I've always played glass cannons so I have this build that's focused my tailored to me focused around knowing that I will bring out my greatsword and any party I come across 1v1 is going to have a ruined knight Okay, they, they will not have any fun. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's just, that's my build. So now, does that mean if two guys get on me, I'm not screwed? Well, yeah, I'm screwed. But at least, <laughs> at least, <laughs> at least somebody, deck, right? at least somebody challenging me to a duel outside of town or wherever, they got it coming to them. So, <laughs> but uh, uh, yeah, my build has multiple in each category. I, I think a lot of people will do that because once you unlock certain tiers, you know how you unlock. Um, particular little extra abilities you saw that right so you're going to look at these extra abilities in your classes and you're going to know there's certain ones you want and th really there's no point going beyond that so you might find in a certain category that 20 points is all you need just to get that little uh buff or whatever it might be well i gotta tell you i've been doing kind of the same thing i was playing around with a couple of different ideas i had for an elementalist and i mean uh I, I have this sort of screen here, I'll pull it up. And one of the things that I thought, okay, for a PvP, and that's the kind of thing, you gotta frame it. For this specific situation, how would I build you know, an elementalist? If I wanted to build an elementalist that was specifically for dueling 1v1 in like 5v5 structured matches, right? Or, or being able to, 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 to deal with fighting 1v1. Okay, I'm making dagger dagger, and then I saw, okay, air magic is very heavily focused on crits, because it increases your prowess and your precision. So it increases your critical chance, and it increases your bonus critical then so I looked in here and I go okay so I'm gonna go way over into air magic but I also want survivability so I'll go way into earth magic so I'll do 30 30 in those two now what 10 where can I put my other 10 points that will really help this specific build and I f settled on arcane power because I like the idea of one of the major trait points in there so that was one of my ideas and then I'm like okay what if I went completely opposite instead of going like really high in two and low in one what if I go like just high in arcane power, like 30 in arcane power, and then 10 across the board in everything else. Because one of the things that arcane power does is allow you to switch attunements quickly. And so that means that all of your different things, so that's a very general elementalist. So if you're just leveling, maybe that's a really good leveling build because anytime you come across a single target, you go into air magic and you do some some single target mass damage. If you have to suddenly go into an event with a, a lot of little guys anywhere, then you got some fire magic that's doing pretty good. And all of those major traits help you all across the board and not just in any one category. So that also seems really viable, especially in world versus world. Well, maybe you're going to be facing somebody one-on-one. -on -one. Maybe you're going to need to kill a keep lord really fast and have to do the single target shutdown. But if you're fighting a lot of enemies, you're going to need AOE. And maybe you're going to need support sometimes. So it's just, it's blowing my mind. There's a lot of really things. And I 
my answer to this whole question is I think there's going to be quite a few viable builds, especially when you combine these with the utility skills. And it seems like they match up. Like, at least when I was looking through the Elementalist, right, there's a lot of utility skills that are specifically aided by specific major traits. And we don't even have all the traits yet. And look what we've done. That's also something that was confirmed, by the way. 12 major traits in every line. And we've only seen about six or seven in most lines. So <laughs> it could get better. It even gets better. It's amazing. I don't know. I just some, something tells me no matter what you do with the Elementalist Bridger, it's going to be a little overpowered. <laughs> well, I hope so. <laughs> I, have a ta I have a talent for picking overpowered stuff. I picked a shaman way before it was considered overpowered in World, in World of Warcraft. I picked a shaman because I'm like, I like the idea of being up in somebody's face, beating them with a mace, and then going, oh, and with my other hand, earth shock. <laughs> it just seemed the coolest thing ever. You're, oh, you're, instant you're, cast. You're an OP hipster. You're I am. The, the <laughs> <laughs> overpowered hipster. You were overpowered before being overpowered, which is cool. Exactly. That's what I'm saying. Yes. Yes, exactly. Uh-oh, Zephyrus says, Walking Dead in nine minutes, go, go, go. All right, so let's get to the final section. <laughs> Not just for him, because I do want to finish up in about an hour. The final section of the round table. Now, we talked about all this great customization. There's a big discussion going on. How often should you be able to respec? Where should you be able to respec? Should it have a cost? What should you be able to do? Et cetera, et cetera. So, let's go down the line here again. Aku... If uh, I'm asking you, let's ask specifically about PvP, structured PvP right now, because this is one of my bones to pick here. What should be changeable about your build? And by build, I mean weapon sets that you have equipped, uh, gear that you have equipped, utility skills that you have equipped, trait lines that you have set up, and major traits that within those categories. Of those things, what should you be able to change in the middle of a structured PvP match? The only thing I would believe that you should be able to um, switch in the midst of battle is your weapons. Everything else needs to be fixed and I would say concrete um, decided on, uh, decided upon before the battle happens. And let me clarify. After. So when you say weapons, I'm, I, obviously there's a weapon switch mid-combat. You can switch between your two weapon sets. But oh, okay. are you saying that in addition to that, say I'm not in combat, and, I, and I've got a great hammer and a, a longbow or something. I'm a warrior equipped. And I want to switch out the longbow for a rifle. Should I be able to do that? With your change, absolutely nothing. I feel that um, in structured PvP, I feel that if you are comfortable with the, your, your, your play style and um, what your weapons you're going to be using as well as your gear and your traits, um, I feel that you should be able to go in there with with your weapon set and do what you're supposed to be doing. I feel that it would take away from the customization. I, I feel, um, excuse me, I would, I, I kind of feel that it would, I would say take away from the, the specificness of being able to say, all right, well, I'm facing this. Let's, uh, let's switch to this real quick and be, you know, have a, a greater advantage. It takes away the skill. If not, it takes away the difficulty. Okay. Vega, what's your response to that? Do you agree or disagree? Um, I think that, you know, switching weapons mid-fight for PvP is good, um, but I think switching armor, no, um, readjusting your tradesman battle, no. Um, I think all those things need to be taken care of, you know, outside the battlefield. Um, not even like you're just out of combat and hiding in the corner changing your stuff, I mean off the map in your town sort of respective. Before, before or after a match. Yes, I don't think, I, you know, switching weapons, it makes sense because, you know, yeah, you can take a longbow and you can take a sword. So obviously that, that makes sense. But, you know, all of a sudden you're, you're going to carry around like a few sets of armor and change armor a bit and fight and then change all your skills up. I don't, I don't think that's realistic or um, it doesn't add anything to the game. It just, I, I think it takes away from it. Okay, Freelancer, your thoughts. Agree or, it sounds like Vega and Aku are kind of in agreement on this. What are your thoughts for structured PvP? For being able to do what exactly? What was the exact question? Whether, are, what should be, what do you think would result in the best game? What should you be able to change in the middle of a match? Let's say you die and you go back to spawn and you're like, well, this isn't working. Can you change your utility skills? Should you be able to change your weapons out for different weapons? Should you be able to change your traits, your major traits, etc.? Of all those things, is there any that you think should be changeable 
in uh, the middle of a structured PvP match? Uh, that that's a that's a new one for me. And all the stuff I've done in terms of competition in the past, I've never come across where you can just completely change things in the middle. Really, um, TF2, you can just change a new class every time you die. Bridger, I'm sorry to have to break it to you. Nobody takes TF2 seriously. C Counter Strike, you can get a new weapon when you die. Counter Strike well, is very that's a new weapon. Oriented you're, talk, you're talking about an entirely new build. That would, I mean, well, if, you're, switch if, out if, a if your zerglings be... aren't working, you can build roaches next time. The next attack, you can do that mid match. It's not that easy, though. I mean, if you, I agree if with you're you, it's not that easy. But you do have access to everything that you want in Star But at a too. cost. I mean, I'll tell you right now. If you're going speedlings and you switch to roaches, I will punish the heck out of you, and you will lose that game. Um, it's, well, I don't play SC2. <laughs> don't take my example seriously, right? Well, okay, but I, I don't know. I guess I'm torn on it because it's uh, it, it's not like you're changing classes, so I guess it can't be too different. And I think you should be a, a, I don't know. I'm torn on that. I would say just preliminary right now, if I had to make a decision, I don't think you should be able to change too much. I really don't. Because, I mean, you should have planned those kind of things out beforehand. And... When you go in with certain builds, if there was like a halftime, metaphorically, you know, uh, then I would see, you know, where you could switch out builds like this isn't working and stuff, but there I isn't. So I could just see the ranger looking up to the ref and going, time out, time out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So let me let me inter interject because I have a completely different opinion, but uh, I come from an FPS background. So uh, to me, and I, this is and I'll first I'll start by saying here's how I think it currently is. And then I'll talk about how I think it should be. Right now, I believe at any point you are out of combat, at any time, type of game, world v. world, structured PvP, or uh, PvE, I believe you can always, out of combat, change your utility skills. So if your heal, the heal that you have equipped isn't working, you can change to a different heal. If you know your utility signet isn't working, you can change to a different utility. So those five options are always there to change out you can always change your elite skill you can always change your heal and you can always change those three utilities out of combat and it's literally just two seconds you click on it you click the new one and then it's in the different slot so i believe that's also the case in in pvp i don't think you can change your gear in pvp i think that is totally picked at the beginning i don't think you can change any of your armor i'm pretty sure you can't change your weapons either though some people think that there it may be possible though i haven't had any confirmation that you can change weapon sets out in the spawn area so that when you die as you find out okay the great sword or the staff or whatever isn't working on my elementalist i need to change to dagger dagger then you might be able to do that during the spawn um, and traits are definitely not changeable in a structured PvP match, to my knowledge. Uh, but you are able to change major traits out at any given time. And I believe that is also true. Uh, that basically, uh, traits and utility skills, major traits and utility skills can be changed. But the numbers in each trait line are unchangeable in PvP. You know, in, uh, in WoW Battlegrounds, you used to, once upon a time, be able to switch out traits and stuff. You could set up your two traits, um, your two the trees. The builds? Um, yeah, your talent builds, traits, whatever. Um, and you used to be able to switch them out on the fly. Uh, it wasn't up until halfway through Lich King that they completely disabled it for the sake of answering to the community who are crying out against the ability to do that. I don't see, I mean, I, I don't like comparing a lot of things in WoW to Guild Wars 2, but if, if, they can't, if they had to come to that in WoW because people were switching out and doing gimmicky things, which is really what happened, and you had these troll setups coming out, and so they just completely shut it down. If that happened there, uh, history and experience would probably say it's going to happen like that in Guild Wars 2 as well, and I guess that's my only stance on it. To me, and this is why I think it's important to have the utility skills specifically changeable. And major traits, I could take it and leave it. I think it would be nice to be able to change major traits because a lot of them are tied directly to utility skills. Some of them specifically say, signants are recharged X faster. So if you decide, okay, this signant isn't working, we need to switch it out, then you, you, their, your major trait is basically worthless at that point. So I think those two go hand in hand, which is why I think we'll see major traits changeable as well. But Major traits, again, are two, two button press. You know, you open up the screen, click, click, you've got a new trait. So it's not like it's something that takes people sitting there in the screen for 10 minutes. If you know the type of builds that you might be switching to, you'll probably be able to do that quick. Why I think it's important is, as Malkier pointed out, there are, uh, let's say, Freelancer, your team comes to the match with a super stun lock setup. Everybody on your team has stuns and dazes and utility skills that allow them to lock people into some kind of a CC, right? 
Nobody on my team has, uh, now my team kind of has the choice. We know that build is out there. We know it's very effective for any teams that don't have, and because all professions do have, a single skill in the utility section that allows them to break stun. Some classes may have other things that allow them to break CC, but there's at least one in every class in the utility section that allows them to get out of stuns. So, if your team comes with a super stun lock and it's basically completely overpowered against anybody that doesn't at least bring that utility skill with them, now my team has to decide. Well, we know it's out there, so we eat A, bring the stun, the, the, the anti-stun utility skill. And if your team brought the stun lock package, then you know, okay, we've made the, a wise choice and maybe we, we, we survive. If you didn't take it, if you guys didn't bring the stun lock package, if instead you brought the super massive condition damage build, you know, as a team, uh, now we're screwed because we didn't take the anti-condition utilities. So what happens there is that at the beginning, before the game even starts, if you can't change out utility skills at all, one team will come into the game with a pretty massive advantage and you will have no way of knowing. It'll basically be rolling the dice. Do we take the stun lock, the anti-stun lock, or the anti-condition? Or do we take both and basically become completely weak against another team that took damage utilities instead? So the utilities basically provide for the fact that there's never going to be any situation where there's a super hard counter set up at the beginning of the game that you can't change the space entirely upon luck based on what the other team has brought. You can always at least get some mitigation by switching I think, out to I think what you're utility. Not, what you're not considering, though, Bridger, is you're talking about the meta. And mm -hmm. if you don't study the meta, then you are at the whim of being, uh, for lack of a better term, a noob. I mean, when it comes to Guild Wars or any competitive sport, any competitive eSport, it's, uh, you, you never come into this. I have never gotten into a match and not known exactly what my opponents were going to throw at me. There hasn't. I can't recall a single FPS or MMO I've played. You don't think where teams will have multiple builds that they practice? I think teams will practice one set build. I mean, you you cannot just throw a mishmash of skills together and expect to switch them out on the fly and be as efficient as you were with the set build that you had been training with from the get go. Um, just the same as in FPSs, there's always certain people that run certain guns. There's uh, in Guild Wars, everybody knows that the big. If, if you did any sort of competitive. Uh, GVG at all, there was a, there shouldn't have been an instance where you went into the GVG not knowing exactly what the enemy was, as the exact skills they were using, and exactly how they were going to execute them out. So what you're aiming for switching out mid game is talking about lower tier competitive gaming, and at that, see, at I that, don't agree. I think if I'm at a I high mean, level of comp competition, that to me, the best way to mess with my opponent's head is to come into a tournament with more than one build. And maybe we'll do one build the first tier. These are builds that we have practiced outside of the tournament, obviously. We'll come in to do, so the first round maybe we'll use, I don't know, just for an example, the stun lock build. And then everybody sees us using that. So when we go into the second match, everybody's expecting it and then we switch it out. It seems to me that would be a very effective thing to do. I just, I, I see, I just know that from previous MMOs, arena teams, etc., you do have those clutch builds, uh, aka otherwise known as troll builds, but anybody with half a bit of intelligence will usually just generally make a well-rounded build. That stun lock build you're talking about, that's a troll build. That is a build that is gimmicky, that will work to a certain Highly point. Highly effective in only very specific situations, right? Exactly, but statistically will not go anywhere. It's just like it is, you brought up StarCraft. It's just like a Zerg rush, okay? Even Idra does a Zerg rush one out of 50 games because there are certain scenarios where you think you can catch him off guard. But the other 49 games, he generally has a well-rounded balance, meaning he can react to anything uh, setup, which I don't see in the, in the higher echelons of PvP it, it being any different. You want to go into it knowing if you don't know exactly what your opponent how they're going to execute their builds you want to be able to adapt to any build so that means that i can't go all stun lock because then if they go all this then i won't be able to react to it and i i just i think this argument when you get up to those higher tiers doesn't have any 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 play in it okay i have a response but i want to give vega a chance he was trying to talk go ahead vega um i just think that you know we're, we're all talking i mean freelance is talking about high level pvp and stuff and personally, I think that that's a very small percentage of all the PvP that people are going to experience. Well, we're talking about I mean, structured PvP, the, and that's... Yeah, that, but, that, but uh, structured PvP... 
Go ahead. Destruction PvP in the sense that, you know, I'm just going to join a game for doing PvP with some friends kind of thing? Well, the structured PvP 5v5, you know, competitive mode, I mean... Are we all in agreement that when you're when you're cre designing the mechanics for this system, you want to design it so that it's not broken at the highest tier, right? Well, I mean, otherwise you're not going to have an esport. Well, well, this this goes into the whole discussion of who do you listen to when, you know, people are reporting, oh, this is overpowered, or this is unbalanced. Do you listen to the pro level people that are the minority, or do you listen to the casual players which are the majority? Quick chat room, which episode did we talk about that in? <laughs> I forget. I know. We, I know we thought about. <laughs> I know it. we I did too. Um, but I mean, I I just think that um, when when I was talking about not being able to change things, I was talking about um, you know your 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 uh, your traits not being able to change those on the fly. I like the idea of being there. able to change your attuity skills, and you know changing your weapons out. But like traits, armor, those things that you know are kind of go towards your build. That is the stuff that I think should be locked in. And I, I think that being able to change, like you were saying, being able to change your utilities up to kind of give a little bit different strategy, I, I think that that kind of makes, mixes things up and makes things interesting. And so let me, let me put it this way, Freelancer. I think the utility, uh, the utility skills changing gives you enough flexibility to react to what your opponent's doing to make sure that the choices that you made before battle aren't such a huge uh, descriptor because, oh, this is the point I was going to make earlier. So what you're saying is any extreme build is going to be basically out because of the fact that it could be hard countered, right? Because it's a high risk. And that means yeah. everybody's going to be bringing a generalized build that's supposed to be able to deal with many different situations. And that, what that does though, is that what you're saying is the only viable build are these, you know, general builds and extreme builds are not viable. But wouldn't it be better to have a system where every build is viable in some situation? I sure, I certainly think it would bring excitement to the table, but it's um, you know, I I think what we're gonna find is that it's not so much the build what that determines. You know, you're you're talking about the build and switching out class sets and this and that, but that's not that's not what's gonna separate two teams, Bridger. Mm -hmm. The what's gonna separate two teams is is the actual coordination between the teams themselves, spatial awareness, being able to pick up that th that third perspective of this guy coming at you in this build and being able to pick up immediately what available CCs he has on him while also judging the cooldowns that this guy just blew on you on this character and doing all that at once. Not it takes a certain gamer to be able to take in all of those aspects at once and also know that these are my cooldowns and that this skill, if I use it in accordance with this skill, it will do just enough damage so that this partner can nuke him down with a final skill. When when you get into all of that, um, it's it, the skills so much at that point don't matter as much as the player skill and the awareness does and the, and the reflexes and the number crunching that you have to do on an immediate basis. That right there is competitive pvp it is not the build it is not the weapon anybody any just like in starcraft or, or even now in wow any arena team anybody that has that training and that aptitude will be able to take any build you throw at them whether they went out whether that enemy team went out and switched mid game or not and be able to demolish what they're coming across just because they have that ability available to them they practice and they practice and they practice and that's that's my opinion. I, I think that the whole conversation of switching out a build is, is trivial when when you're coming up against a team that is just going to laugh at you when you try to do something gimmicky. But I do, Bridger. I do think that if they open up the skills so much that allows for these little tricky builds and stuff to come out, we're going to get a, got a lot of good laughs. I, I'm not so f <laughs> so know? much advocating the gimmicky builds. I'm just using them as an example. Uh, to try and illustrate what what you might need to change up your uh, your what, the reason that you might need to change up your idea what you, what you're doing. Um, to me, I think a, a really good analog with just you know saying okay, you can only change your utilities and maybe your major traits and nothing else is in League of Legends, for example. When you go into a League of Legends match, uh, you are only going to be playing uh, what your 
your team comp has allowed you to do. You have this much CC, you have this much this, you have this much that, right? But you do have some way to react to what your opponents are doing in that you can buy items to try and offset what's going on in the field. You can buy magic resist if their opponent, if your opponents are getting uh, their magic damage is really what's killing you. You can buy armor if it's the uh, the AD carry that's, that's the problem. So they do give you the opportunity to kind of respond just a little bit to what's going on in the field and so i think just being able to change your utility skills and you're let's be honest you're probably only going to be changing maybe a couple of them in a match you're probably not going to be changing a whole lot but maybe okay this elite skill clearly isn't working because they happen to bring um you know long-ranged weapons so they just can kite me when i go into tornado mode or something let's just use that as an example changing out to a different elite skill might not change too much about your build you're still going to be have the traits lined up like this. You're still going to be focused on support or healing, whatever your traits are set up to do. But maybe it just, you know, makes it so that you're, you can you can react a little bit to what's going on in the same way that buying items in League of Legends allows you to react to what's going on. Yeah, I just, I think that to all the players out there listening to this, if you can listen to this and say, you know what, I really want to be that competitive player, don't. I mean, changing out builds and stuff is dandy, but don't concentrate on thinking that this great sword is better than this scepter. I mean, that's that's the wrong way of thinking about it. You should be thinking along the lines of, I need to be 0.10 seconds faster on pressing the number three when I Execution follow up with over, number two. Over yeah, predetermined. It, and and I think the people that master that sort of training regime will. It, it won't so much matter what kind of build they have. And and I would love to see everybody do that. I would love to see all of the, the fellow rogues from WoW, you know, be able to follow up their stuns perfectly and stuff. It's just, even as we say this, six months into the game, people will think they have this great build, right? You know, that they... Uh, they found the perfect combination of skills, Bridger. You know, they got the heal they want, the signet they want, they have, and, and they think they have the ideal build and they can crush anything. But they will always, always, always be greatly disappointed when they come across the guy that didn't train exactly what skills that he wanted and this or that. He didn't concentrate that. Instead, he concentrated on his reaction times, his response times, his dexterity in general. Okay, so, um, Aku, you started off by saying... Nothing changed at all. Freelancer and I have been talking back and forth. Have you been swayed at all? Do you think utilities, which are currently changeable, should they stay changeable? Do you think maybe they shouldn't be changeable at all? I would say you actually kind of swayed me. Um, I, 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 I take back what I said, and I, and I think I would uh, change it in the sense that I think utility, utility skills should be able to be changed, but um, I think traits um, should st you know stay the same. I don't think that... Uh, by changing a utility skill will drastically change the way that person is playing his or her class. Whereas I believe changing a trait or, or changing their traits could drastically change someone from playing a, uh, a more support to, you know, strictly damage. And that might throw off the game a bit into almost a, I would say, an unfair, uh, an unfair realm. Um, but utility skills, as you said, you know, all right, you know, this guy, you know, he, he's really sticking on me as a ranger. I might want to take that, you know, that enfeeble... Uh, entrapment skill, you know, and, you know, use that instead of my, you know, my call the wild skill, you know what I'm saying? So yeah. I think that I, you kind of swayed me in that regard, so. All right. Well, I had planned to also talk about, you know, what should be changeable in world versus world and what should be changeable in PVE and, and the whole thing, but we're kind of running over time here, so uh, maybe we'll get to that next week as well, but uh, this has been a really interesting conversation, and it's good to hear all sides. Any final thoughts from anybody here uh, before we cl close out this show? I hope they expand the trait system even more than they have. <laughs> <laughs> he wants to spend months and months staring at his screen and going, what if, what if I just, oh, maybe the possibilities, this one, the possibilities. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. And I will get my build and say my precious, you know, <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm right there with you. I can't wait until we can get our hands on it. I want to really test out the, the theories that I've had about the various elementalist builds. And, and, I, and I think if Arena Net's listening, just consider the fact that we live in a world now where people actually enjoy playing Sims 3, you know, in, in Farmville and all, <laughs> and all of these games that you have to, you know, customize everything and people are eating it up by the millions, you know. So there you go, Arena Net. Consider that <laughs> and, expand, <laughs> and expand your customization options by 500 more dies and more aesthetic items. <laughs> 
<laughs> get back in there and make us more stuff, even though the game isn't even out yet. We want more. We'll pay. I keep throwing money yeah, at the screen. I will pay ten bucks more for Guild Wars Two if they if they add seven more trade more lines. Items. <laughs> <laughs> Double. Okay, we've added cross class. <laughs> no, God, no. Let's end before we get to there, ladies and gentlemen. I am Bridger, and with me, of course, Freelancer, Vega, and Aku. Thank you guys for joining me. And uh, Thanks we'll for see having us. Yeah, absolutely. It's been great. Another fantastic discussion. We will see you guys next week. Uh, don't forget, it is Sunday at 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time instead of 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. It's four hours earlier than normal. So with that, I'm signing off. But stay tuned if you're in the chat room because we're going to do some legacy in-house LOL games, if I'm not mistaken. And the link will be posted right in there. Here we go. Have a good night. Good night, everyone. Care, good night, everyone. Players have an attention span that begins to drop after just the first dungeon. But the attention dungeon. But the attention span of the player that uses Dungeon Dan doesn't begin to diminish until the second dungeon. Download Dungeon Dan today.